Of course, we won't always be asked to find a confidence interval by hand. A lot of times we'll be given computer output for a confidence interval, and we have to be able to analyze that computer output and answer a lot of questions about it. For example, confidence interval output often shows up in medical journals, things like that, as well as perhaps exams and statistics courses. So we have a study of random students in sample one were shown positive evaluations of an instructor. And the random students in sample two were shown negative evaluations of the instructor, same instructor. So then all, sub all subjects were shown the same 20 minute lecture video given by the same instructor. They were then asked to rate the instructor using three questions and a summary rating score was calculated. Were students' ratings influenced by the prior students' evaluations? So the confidence interval outputs for two computer programs related to the study are below. Use these results to answer the questions. Okay. So I just have, um, actually, I, I lied. I don't have two computer programs. I only have one computer program here. I eliminated StatCrunch here, and I only have Minitab here. So let me fix that. Okay. So here's Minitab. And Minitab tells us that it's running a two-sample two t-test and CI, that's confidence interval over there. Okay, so first thing they want us to do is find N1 and N2. Because it says we have sample 1 and sample 2, so little n1 and little n2 will be our sample sizes. So you can see that oops, sample size 1 would be 38. Right? And sample size 2 would be 33. They're in that orange box kind of thing that I, um, I highlighted for you. All right, there we have it. So since our confidence level is 95, or excuse me, 99.5%, I have to put that in there, 0.995, then our alpha is 1 minus 0.995, which means it's 0.005. All right, so there's our alpha right there. And then N1 was 38, and N2 is 33, and those are coming from that orange part that I highlighted right there. All right, next we need to verify that the requirements needed to construct a confidence interval are met. Well, to do that, let's remind ourselves what those requirements are. And they're the same requirements for constructing a uh, Excuse me, con do, conducting a hypothesis test for independent sample two means. So I'm going to pull up the inferential statistics sheet right here. You can see up here with the requirements to conduct the test. We need to know that the samples were obtained using simple random sampling, that the samples are independent of each other, and that the populations from which the samples are drawn are normally distributed or our sample sizes are larger than 30 for both groups. Well, we definitely have all three of those things. So let me type those up one second. All right, so we have the first requirement that it's a simple random sample for both samples and that they're independent. And both of those things are given and or implied by this setup here. When you have two groups of subjects that are randomly drawn and aren't related to each other, that's random and independent. And then you just need to know that N1 and N2 are both greater than 30 or that the data sets were both normal. And we don't have the latter, but we have the former. We know that they're both sample sizes are greater than 30 because we found them right here. They're 38 and 33. All right, so that's done. We've got our three smiley faces. We can move on. Now we need to come find, or excuse me, um, find the standard error of the sample mean for group one. So X bar is sample mean. One just means group one. So you can see right there we have the standard deviation, which is 0.533. So just a quick reminder of what that means. The standard error we learned in section 8.1 is sigma over the square root of n, um, which is approximated by s over the square root of n, right there. Okay, so if that's the case, and we know that it's sigma over the square root of n, and we don't have sigma, but we do have s, right, because the problem tells us See, it's blocked out standard error, what we're trying to find, but it does tell us that s, which is the standard deviation, is 0.533. So we can use that to approximate the standard error. So I just typed that up right here. So it's 0.533 over the square root of, I believe it's 38 for that first group. Let me double check that. So 0.533 over the square root of 38, so let me grab a calculator. and see 0.533 divided by the square root 
of 38, enter, and get 0 0.0865. So that's what I'll put there, 0 0.0865. All right, now in part D, they want us to kind of use the same idea, but we're going to go back the other direction. So we are looking for the standard deviation for the negative group. Now the negative group was group 2. So it's, group 2 was shown the negative results. So we need to have this um, standard error for that group, which is right here, 0 0.094. So we're going to use that 0 0.094 right there to solve for the remaining blank right there, the standard deviation. All right, so it's the same formula, but we're going to substitute in a different spot. There we have it. So the standard error of the second group, and remember that's the negative group, is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. But we know that the square root of n means the square root of 33 because we found n, oops, sorry, there's a typo there, n2 to be 33 a long time ago. Right, so n1 is 38, n2 is 33, and we know that the standard error is 0 0.094. So to solve this for s, all I have to do is multiply both sides by the square root of 33. And of course, if you do it to the left, you have to do it to the right. Keep it all fair and balanced. There we have it. So over here, these will cancel and leave me um, just S left over, right? So I need to grab a calculator and make it multiply square root of 33 times 0 0.094. So square root 33, and now I need to use the right arrow to get out of that square root. So I hit the right arrow, then times it by 0 0.094. Enter. And I get 0.53998, which really would round up to 540. Right. So that's what I'm going to say it is. All right, so now that we know that that's 0 0.540, we're done with that problem. And then the next one's really quite simple. It just wants to know what is the confidence interval. And the confidence interval would be those two numbers right there that I've highlighted in blue, negative 0 0.093 and positive 0.647. There, and when I type that up, that just kind of flew to the other side of the screen, but there it is negative 0 0.093 and positive 0.647. All right, so next they want us to compute the um, point estimate for the difference between the two groups. Now remember that the point estimate is the center of your interval. So we're going to use that in order to be able to find it, right? Because it wants us to find this two ways, using the data and then using the confidence interval. And I think that was a bit of a lie, so I, I deleted that second part of that because I had blocked off so much from the output here, you actually can't do it two ways. You can only find it one way. And that's by taking the two ends and adding them up and dividing by two. Because if you recall, the point estimate is in the exact center of the confidence interval for um, two means, exact center of confidence interval for two means. That actually happens with all confidence intervals except for the ones for the variance and standard deviation. Let's go back and look at the formulas real quickly just to remind ourselves of that. So when you look at the confidence interval formulas, all of them have that plus or minus in them. See, plus or minus, plus or minus, and so on, including the one we're looking at right now, which is this one right here. So it has that plus or minus in it. That means that the center of this is the point estimate, which is the x bar 1 minus x2 bar, or x bar 1 minus x bar 2. There you go. The only ones that don't work like that are variance and standard deviation because they're built from a chi-square distribution, which is not symmetric. All right, so since it's in the exact center, all we have to do is add up our two numbers, the low number and the high number, and divide by 2. So let me see. But I did negative 0 0.093 plus 0 0.647, and I get 0.554, and then I divide that by 2, I get 0.277. And there we have the center. So I know that x bar 1 minus x bar 2, because that's the center of the mean, or of the interval, excuse me, is that number, right? And then notice why I'm saying it's the center. It's because it's right here in the formula. See right there? So that's x bar 1 minus x bar 2, because that's your point estimate. All right. So then what must be the mean for group 2? Well, I know the mean for group 1, if I scroll back here, is 2.613. So that's x bar 1. 
So I could just do a little substitution and solve for x bar 2. So here's that substitution. So we have x bar 1 minus x bar 2. That's 2.613 minus x bar 2, which I don't know. And I found that it's approximately 0.277, correct? So now if I just add x bar 2 to both sides um, and then subtract 0.277, or I could subtract the 2.613 and then just divide by a negative 1. I mean, it doesn't really matter which way we go. One way or another, we need to add, um, turn the x bar 2 to be positive. So we need this to turn into a plus sign. All right, let me type that up one second. So there we have it. So I add x bar 2 to both sides. That gets 0 0.277 plus x bar 2 equals 2.613. Then I have to subtract 0 0.277 from both sides to get it by itself, or the x bar 2 by itself, I should say. So there we have it. I subtracted 0 0.277 from both sides. So I just need to grab the calculator and make it to 2.613 minus 0 0.277. And I get 2.336. So that's the other group right there. That's their mean. And there we have it. So we just substituted in x bar 1 and the difference that we found from the confidence interval that we solved for x bar 2. All right, so in order to compute the margin of error, we're going to need to remember something about the margin of error, namely that the error is equal to half the interval width. There, I just typed it up in words. Margin of error is half the interval width. So it's the distance, if you remember, from the center out to the edges. So what we need to do is we need to find the interval's width and divide it by 2. Here, and I drew us a little picture so we could see. So the error is the same on both sides, and I labeled the one on the right with blue, the one on the left with red, but it doesn't really matter. It's half the width of the interval, the interval going from negative 0.093 to positive 0.647. So what I need to do is find 0 0.647 minus negative, so minus a negative 0 0.093, or if you will, you can add them. You get 0.74, and then I need to cut that in half, so divide by 2. And so I find the margin of error to be 0.37. There, so there's the margin of error, 0.37. Now, does this confidence interval suggest that there is a significant difference between the professor ratings for students who are shown a positive review and a negative review, and explain? Well, just a little note for you on this one. I kind of lied about this data. Um, so the real data actually does show a relationship and that students that are shown a negative um, review are significantly different but I lied on this and changed the numbers to make it so that there's not a significant difference so just a little side note to you so what am I getting at um, well if there was no difference between the groups you if you recall from this entire chapter that would mean that the null hypothesis is going to stand there's no difference between the groups so when you subtract them you'll have zero so when you look up at the confidence interval, you can see zeros right there. It's inside that confidence interval. And since our interval does contain zero, that implies that there is not a significant difference between the two groups. So there we have it. Since our confidence interval does contain zero, this implies that there is not a significant difference between professor ratings for students who are shown a positive and negative review. And again, first of all, that's not true in real life, but pretend it is for the sake of this um, assignment for this, these notes here. Um, and it's because that zero is your null hypothesis value is contained within your interval. So your interval is not showing that it's different, right? You're always trying to show it's different than zero, different than what you thought, different than the null hypothesis. And you were not able to show that here. Because zero is contained in our interval, then it seems like zero is completely fine and the null hypothesis should be allowed to stand. All right, we're all done with section 11.3. I'll see you back here for section 11.1, which will be working with proportions.